for those of you that are joining us online or for those of you who have uh, we've never had an opportunity to connect with we would love to do that there are a couple of different ways if you're here in the building you can grab a card out of the rack in front of you or shoot that qr code but we would invite you to stand with me as we begin our time of corporate singing and worship
turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. As I've been prayerfully considering where to turn in God's Word to guide us for the moment in which we find ourselves, I was reminded of a scripture that I often use with you all when we do the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it often, we often turn there and talk about God's guidance for how we are to take the Lord's Supper. But there's a couple verses just prior to that that I'd like to call to our attention just as a lead into, a lead into what I want to say today and over the next several weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. They're on the screen there in front of you. It says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. The book of 1 Corinthians gives lots of insight into Churches and when they deal with conflict and difficulty. And one thing that's very enlightening is to realize that sometimes God allows conflict within the body of Christ because it reveals those who are genuine. Those who are genuine. Those who are genuine believers. I think Scripture is very clear that genuine believers are displayed in a couple different ways. We're going to consider one of those today actually for the next couple of weeks. 
I think genuine Christianity and those who are genuinely redeemed of the Lord is displayed in people's behavior and in their belief system. How people believe, what people believe and how people behave is guidance into knowing those who are truly genuine. Jesus gave many illustrations of this. In Matthew chapter 7, for example, in verse 20, he says, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. He says the same thing in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, where he says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You see, how we behave is seen in the fruit of our life. How we behave is, it shows up in the fruit that takes place in our life. The root of the tree of our life is displayed in the fruit that is produced. Now, many, many, many churches gather and they just focus on behavior. Behavior modification. If you do X, that makes you a good Christian, but the Christian life is much more than just behavior. It's not behavior modification. Ultimately, you know, those churches gather, and maybe a pastor might stand and say, well, you know, I don't cuss, and I don't chew, and I don't go with girls that do. You've probably heard that before, right? But Christianity is much more than just about behavior. Behavior is a display of what's inside of us. In fact, the second way in which our genuineness is shown is not just in how we behave, it's also in what we believe. What we believe is vital to be a follower of Jesus. You cannot follow Him and not believe in Him. And how do you know if a person truly believes? It shows up in their heart's desires. What you truly believe shows up in what your heart desires, what it longs for. If you really want to know what a person is like and what drives them, pay attention to what they will be willing to do to get what they want or how they react when they don't get it. When a person doesn't get what they want, out of that reaction is their heart. Or if a person, what a person is willing to do to get what they want shows what is in a person's heart. That's why today, and actually next week as well, I want to focus on Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 contains a very familiar story, and it's called the parable of the prodigal son is where we're going to camp out at. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that many people are familiar with this story, but they don't understand it. So therefore, I think it's important for us to understand at the moment in which we find ourselves that our heart's desires reveal a lot, and sometimes it produces conflict with other people. And it's important to understand how we understand our heart's desires, and Luke 15 helps us to understand that in capsule. And I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to read part of it. And the reason why we stand is because this is God's word to us. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11, and here's what it says. This is, and he said, it's speaking of Jesus, and Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the older of them said to, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into the far into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, some of your translations say when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Will you pray with me? God, we've opened your word. Now we pray that you would open our hearts. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hands to obey what you tell us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty, mighty, and precious name, amen. Please be seated. It is a great fallacy to think that this story is about only one son. Verse 11 says what? There was a man who had how many sons? Two. So it's, it's wrong to think that this story is just about one son. There was two sons, an elder brother and a younger brother. In fact, as we look closely at this story, both this week and next week, this is a sermon in two parts, so if you don't like part one, you can skip part two, all right? But this is a story about two sons, the rebel and the rule keeper, and both of them were running from God. One's a rebel, one's a rule keeper, but both were running from God in different ways. This is not primarily a feel-good tale about a father who was nice to a son who came home. That is not what this parable is about. It's about much more than that. In fact, the context of this parable, Jesus is actually calling out a group of people who thought they were doing pretty well for themselves, and you might be thinking the same thing today. And I'm here not to be your friend, but to tell you the truth. I hope I'm your friend in the end, but it's more important that I tell you the truth. Look at the beginning of Luke chapter 15. It says there are two groups of people that are listening to Jesus talk. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Verse 2 says, And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. As you look more closely, you'll notice in the story that one brother corresponds to one group of people, and one, group course, one brother corresponds in the story to the other group of people. In fact, this parable is actually three-dimensional. It's not just a about a son who rebels and goes away and comes back and is received. It's not just about an elder brother who's upset that his brother comes home and gets such a lavish celebration. It's also about a father who loves and cares. It's about our heavenly father. Luke 15 is all about the fact that God loves sinners. God loves sinners, and I'm so glad that he does, because you know what? I, I are one, and so are you. And in general, your tendency is to be one of these two brothers. So listen up. Jesus tells this, uh, Luke tells us uh, in Luke chapter 15, about to how God loves sinners, and he displays that in different ways. Verses 4 through 7 tells us the parable of the lost sheep. God loves sinners so much that uh, a shepherd has a bunch of sheep. One of them wanders off, and he cares about this one so much that he leaves the others to find this one. That's how much God loves us. He is seeking to save us. There was a moment in June of 1980 when God found me. Guess what? I wasn't looking for him, but he came looking for me, and I'm grateful. God loves sinners. I'm not sure what your story is. You either have a story or you need one. But it goes on to say that not only 
uh, the parable of the lost sheep, but verse 8 through 10 gives us the parable of the lost silver. This is the person who has a silver coin. It rolls away. It, it is lost, and they do everything they can to find it. Lost people matter to God. That's the point of that parable. And then we find the parable that we began to read just now, and it is a mistake to think it's about one lost son, it's about two lost sons. And I want you to ask yourself, which one are you? Ultimately, this parable teaches us how much God loves us, but it points out the inescapable truth. You need the Lord. You need the Lord. Your sins will either be pardoned in Christ or punished in hell. Depends on what you do with the Savior. You see, the pardoned in Christ are evidenced by their beliefs and by their behavior. It's a story, this parable is, it's a, it's a story, a play in two acts. Act one is about the younger brother. First of all, in scene one, he makes a request, which is shocking. He says, Father, give me my inheritance. Give me what I have coming to me. And that's shocking. You know why? Because when is an inheritance distributed? Not a trick question. It's when someone dies. It's almost like the younger son is saying, I would rather you die. Just give me what's mine. You know the other shocking thing about this parable is how the father responds. The father says, okay. Okay. By the way, that's exactly how God treats us when we rebel against him. When we shake our fist in his face and say, I know what you said, I'm going the other direction. And according to Romans chapter 1 and 2 and 3, actually all of the Bible in reality, it's, it tells us that God says, okay, okay. So in scene 1 we see the younger brother's request and then we see the younger brother's rehearsal because the scripture tells us that the son takes this Inheritance and he squanders it all. He, he's out of control. He's partying and having a good time, but it all the good times run out, and soon he comes to his senses in the mud with the pigs, and he comes up with a plan and rehearses a speech that he'll return to his father and that he'll hire himself out as an apprentice so he can pay his father back. In fact, he got in such a bad place that he was longing to eat pig slop. That's pretty low. I wonder how low we have to get in our life for God to get our attention. That's what happened to him. Soon he had this rehearsal and then we see in act one, scene three, the younger brother's redemption. He comes up with a plan, rehearses a speech. He goes home, the father sees him coming, he runs to him, which, by the way, didn't happen. Fathers didn't gird up their robe to run anywhere. And when he meets him, the youngest son, he has a speech, and he begins to give that speech, and the father cuts him off and says, I see that you're truly repentant. Go get the best robe, put it on him. Put the ring on his finger saying, he belongs to me. I'm not disowning him. He belongs to me. Kill the fattened calf. Here is a moment that they'd been preparing for. You and I, when we want the fattened calf, we just go down to Kroger. Not in those days. They had to prepare for a very special occasion. And it was so special that the father invites the whole community to join him. But that's just act one. There's a second act that we'll consider next week. And that's how the elder brother reacts. And in both cases, both in the case of the rebel and in the rule keeper, it reveals their heart and it reveals our heart. Today I want to take the prodigal out to a far country and bring him back home and point out the fact that every person needs God. In fact, it teaches us four very important things. Number one, it teaches us the desire that motivates the life of a rebel. Verse 11 to 12 says that the younger 
brother, the young son, comes to his father and says, Give me what is due me. He wants independence from his father. And that's where all sin begins. It begins with a desire for independence. Beyond sinful words and deeds, sin is a matter of the heart. It's a heart of rebellion that strives for independence from God's control over our lives. And also credit for our lives. First of all, the rebel desires control over his life. He says to his father, give what I have coming to me. No son would dare go to their father and initiate such a conversation. The father's blessing was to be discussed at the father's initiative and bestowed at the father's discretion. Yet this son demands his part of the estate and shockingly the father grants his son's request. And verse 13 tells us that uh, not, not a few days later he gathered all that he had and he took a journey to a far country where he squandered everything. You see, the prodigal didn't just move out of his father's house. He moved out of his father's country. It was not enough to move to the other side of the city. He went to the other side of the world. He no longer wanted to submit to the father's rules. He no longer wanted the father's permission. He no longer wanted to abide by the father's curfew. He wanted to be his own man to go to a far Country. This is the story of every rebel. They want independence. Be able to dictate their own life. Genesis 3 tells us it all began in the very beginning with our great, 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 great parents, Adam and Eve. The serpent said to Eve that she should indeed eat from the forbidden tree. Why? Because... God, uh, Genesis 3, 6, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. You will be like God. That is the origin of all sin, of wanting to be our own God, to be our own boss, to be the captain of our own ship, the master of our own soul. You ever heard that phrase? That's the definition of sin. And our sinful nature does not want a relationship with God. We want to be our own gods. We want to use the true God to help us serve ourselves better. We're like the younger son. We want to be independent. But yet we want God to finance our independence. You been there? You see, if he were a real man, he would have left and not asked for anything. Instead, the younger son's request was proof that he could not make it on his own, yet he was determined to control his own life independent of his father. And before we shake our heads at this younger son, understand that many in this room have lived that kind of life. Sometimes sinners in our day leave home by leaving traditional morality. That's leaving home. Sometimes they leave home by joining the military. Sometimes they leave home by growing out their hair or moving in with their girlfriend or boyfriend or by eloping. Sometimes they leave home by going away to college and adopting the philosophies that the professors teach them that are very different than their own parents. They begin to think that their, their parents are dumb as a rock because some person who stands in front of them in a classroom with a doctor in front of their name tells them that. They're rebels in our day. They're still around, folks. And some of them are you. You see, the rebel wants independence, but they also want credit for their own life. The father, in this case, financed his son's independence. The son's grand plan would not work Unless he went to the far country. You see, if he wore those fancy clothes and drove that fancy car and enjoyed that plush condominium in his own hometown, everybody would know how he got it. He got it from daddy. You see, that's true of sinners. They want credit all to themselves. To go somewhere where no one knows you. And to be able to take credit for your own life. Romans 1 explains it this way. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. The sinful heart does not honor God with thankfulness. And our unrighteous life is displayed in our utter ungratefulness. Folks, it's not deep theology. It's basic etiquette. When your kids uh, get a gift, parents usually ask two questions. Where'd you get it? And what did you say? Where'd you get it? They want to know, did you steal it? (laughs) And what did you say? Did you thank someone for it? You know the problem with the rebel is they struggle with both questions. What do we... How do we have what we have? It's because God has been gracious to us and blessed us. And we struggle, the rebel does, in giving thanks. You see, thankfulness, gratefulness, is a mark of someone who follows the Lord. But the rebel doesn't want that. But you know, it creates a dilemma. There's a dilemma that confronts the life of the rebel. First of all, the fact that The pleasures of sin are real. It says that he gathered all that he had, verse 13, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And verse 30, the elder brother says that his sibling had squandered his life with prostitutes. We don't know that to be true. That's not told in the story. But we do know that he went on quite a spending spree until the recession hit. It's safe to assume that the younger brother had a good time. He squandered it all and he had a good time doing it. You see, you have to understand that that the issue with sin is that the pleasures of sin are real. They are real. There are people that live their lives far from God, maybe within view of our church right here this morning, and they're not miserable. They're having a good time. They live in a plush house, drive a nice car, have a wonderful job. People look up to them, and they're having a good time. They're not miserable. Sin is pleasurable. In fact, there's a a very well-known tourist attraction in America that has a very famous motto, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I tend to think that the younger son went to the Vegas of the day, and he was hoping that what went on there stayed there. You know, being lost can be fun. There are many hardened sinners who are more healthy, wealthy, successful, prominent, and happy than faithful Christians, but here's the issue. If The gospel is not real. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15 that we are to be pitied. You know why? If the gospel is not real, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we should not follow him. If none of that is true, we should be pitied, the scripture says. You know why? Because we missed the party. (laughs) We missed the party. But I'm here to tell you that ultimately... The joy of following the Lord and the long-term benefit of following Him is far beyond the sinful life that will be life that is pleasurable for a season because we have to understand that not only are the pleasures of sin real, they're always temporary. Verse 14 says, And when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. This prodigal son had fun in the far country until he'd spent everything, emptied his accounts, maxed out his credit cards, and his friends abandoned him. In fact, his his friends were perfectly willing to be with him as long as he had money to pass around. But it's amazing how friends like that vaporize when when you go broke. When you when you're poe, they don't show up. Real friends stick with you even when you're going through difficulty. The prodigal son found himself in desperate need. The party was over. That's the dilemma that confronts the life of sin. Being lost can be fun, but it does not last. It never lasts. Sin is pleasurable, but the pleasures of sin is fleeting. In the economy of Scripture, 
what we know is that truly valuable things last the longest. The sinful pleasures of the far country are never costs, never worth what it costs. They're only temporary. Foolishness may interest you for a while, but it won't last. Greed may thrill you for a while, but it won't last. Immorality may gratify you for a while, but it won't last. The nightlife may excite you for a while, but it won't last. Strong drink may stimulate you for a while, but it won't last. Ungodly companions may please you for a while, but it won't last. Worldly pleasures may satisfy you for a while, but it won't last. And then the life of sin comes to a discovery. That's exactly what happens to the younger son. The younger son, he learns a lesson. He learns the lesson that he needs the Lord. It says when he'd spent everything, verse 14, severe famine comes, a recession hits, he begins to be in need. Verse 15, then he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country he has a job feeding the pigs and soon it gets so bad that he's longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate i'm not sure about you but you got to be pretty low to be longing to eat what pigs eat i mean i like bacon and i'm all for ham but i don't want to hang out with them right this poor fellow got so low he's longing to eat the food that he's that thrown out to be eaten by pigs. It's a hard lesson that comes when the pleasures of sin come to an end with a screeching halt. It's a hard lesson, but it always comes. And the lesson is it doesn't last. So much so that the younger son begins to come to his senses and realize that his hired, the hired servants of his father are well taken care of and have it better than he does. And here he is acting like an animal desiring to eat food that pigs eat. And so he makes up his mind that he's going to go home. You see, this is the inevitable lesson that the life of sin teaches. You need the Lord. Anything that you put and anyone ahead of, of God, anything that's in the way, you'll, you'll need God to help you with those things, people, and situations. You cannot survive on the blessings of God. You need the God who blesses. For you see, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's the lesson of sin. It's a life of misery. And the difficulty is where you learn the lesson. The classroom where sin teaches it is the classroom of life. In verse 17, it says he comes to his senses. In the midst of the muddy pigsty, he comes to his senses. And for some people, it takes a long time of rebellion until they come to their senses. Everything that they've pursued have come to an end. And maybe that's why you're listening today. Maybe that's why you're here today. Because you've lost it all. It's all been broken and you hit rock bottom. Sometimes that's what it takes. For the rebel, sometimes the rock bottom is a long way down. The pastor J.C. Ryle said this, Hell is truth known too late. Too late. Folks, don't wait for life to catch up with you before you trust and obey the, the Lord. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. Even today, the rebel can come home, which points out the, the last thing in this parable, the deliverance that delivers that redeems the life of the rebel. The deliverance that redeems the life of the rebel. He comes to himself <clears throat> and he thinks, how many of my father's servants have more than enough? I'll arise and go to my father and just confess to him, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. See, the last time the prodigal saw the father, he was demanding his inheritance. 
Now he would go home and beg for a job. He's been humbled. For some of us, it takes a lot to humble us. <clears throat> it takes a lot to strip, of, strip us of our pride. <clears throat> See, for this younger son, working harder in the pig pen was not going to fix the solution. He needed to go home. That's the truth of redemption. The answer is just going home. You can come home to God even today. The amazing thing is how the father treats him. The father sees him coming. I, and I tend to think the reason the father sees him on the road and runs to him is because the father had been looking for him to come home. He wanted him to come home. Perhaps every day he looked out on that dusty road hoping that one day he'd see his son and it wasn't that day. He longed for him to come home, but he, he didn't. And then there was another day and he, he looked and he longed. He, it, no, that's, that's not him. He kept looking and finally one day he saw him. It, it's him. It's him. And he runs to meet him. And the son has a speech all rehearsed. And the father didn't even let him finish his speech. Because he understood that his son was truly repenting. And he ultimately says to his son, you are one of mine. You see, the heart of the father always celebrates when the prodigal, when the rebel comes home. And that's the real question. Will we join the party ourselves? The father put the best robe on him. He put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, killed the fattened calf, threw the mother of all parties for the whole community celebrating his son has come home. The father was so excited, he even was willing to go out and beg his other son to come and join the party. God alone has everything your soul needs, spirit craves, heart desires, mind imagines, and strength pursues. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life. So the question is, will you, if you're a rebel, will you come home? You see, God's love and forgiveness can pardon and restore any and every kind of sin and wrongdoing, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've strayed, no matter how much inside you know that you have rebelled against God. God's willing to forgive that and wipe that all out. True stole, the true story is told of uh, Maria and her daughter, Christina. Maria's husband, unfortunately, died not long after the birth of her one and only child, Christina, a daughter. She was forced to raise this girl on her own, and when Christina came of age, Maria expected her to remain in the family, of course, and carry the load, but Christina was fixated with life in the big city. They lived in New York State, and Christina was fixated on the Big Apple. She wanted to go there, but yet Maria did everything she could to warn her daughter of the dangers that were out there. But one morning, Maria woke up to find that Christina and all of her belongings were missing. Maria, the mother, knew exactly where she was, and so she went to the big city to find her daughter. But before she left, left she took a snapshot of her face, and she went to the local store and got copies of them made, pictures of herself, and she had written a note on the back of these pictures, and all throughout New York City, she posted these pictures of herself. Till one day, Christina saw a picture of her mother on a bulletin board, and she had hit really hard times. She'd squandered it all. All those things her mother warned her about had come true. And she was at the end of herself and she saw this picture of her mother. And she was shocked to find it. And so she tore the picture off the bulletin board. On the, and on the back of it was a note that read, 
wherever you are, whatever you've done, it doesn't matter. I love you. Come home. And you know what Christina did? She went home. And all around us, God has given us a picture of himself. And on the back of it, he says, come home. When he sent Jesus to this earth, he sent us a picture of himself and stamped in Jesus' life was, come home. Every snowflake that falls is a reminder of the great, powerful, creative power of God. And if we could look on the back of it, it tells us that we should come home. Every raindrop that falls is a reminder of God's love for us. His tears falling that say, come home. Home. If we look in a microscope, we would see that in every cell of our body, it is stamped the beautiful picture of God himself. In fact, if you research, you'll find that in every human cell, there is a protein that holds them all together, a protein called laminin. It's what keeps our cells connected together. You know what that protein is in the shape of? It's in the shape of a cross. God's saying... Come home. If we look up in the night sky at night, we'll see God's creative power displayed in the universe. It is a picture, again, of him. And you know what he's telling us? Come home. That's what he's saying. You see, this story is a story about two brothers. We've only dealt with one of them. We'll deal with the next one next week. But I'm here to tell you, there are probably some in this room that you have lived the life of the rebel and maybe today you need to come home. You need to come home. God the Father, the Heavenly Father is ready and willing and waiting for you to come home. The old song goes like this. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, trod. I'm, Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. I'm tired of sin and straying. Lord, now I'm coming home. I trust thy love. Believe thy word. Lord, I'm coming home. That's the gospel message is we get to come home if we would only do like the rebel did when he came to his senses and he went home in repentance saying the way that I've gone is wrong and I want to come home oh I pray that there'll be some maybe even today that you just want to come home. Will you pray with me? Lord, we're very grateful that you're a father who is willing to receive us no matter what we've done or how far we've strayed. No matter how Far we've gone, no matter what we've done, what we've said, the rebellion that we've had in our heart displayed in a hundred different ways, where we haven't even considered what you'd have us to be and to do. We've run, run away from you, sometimes in obvious ways, like this younger brother who ran away to the far country. Many of us have run away from you in all kinds of different ways. Oh, how grateful we are that you're a God who is waiting for us to come home, but we must make that step. And I pray, oh God, that you would, even this very morning, Lord, that you would call some of your children home. No longer to run away in the opposite direction, no longer living a life of rebellion, but instead submission to the Lord the Father who loves and cares. Because it's in that moment that we realize that that's when the true party begins. 
And as we gather together as a people, one thing that we long for is that we can celebrate that on an ongoing basis, that we can celebrate sinners coming home. God, may that be true of this church on this hill, that you would make us a place where people come home, that they come home to you, and that we might be a part of that. Oh, the burden, the burden we have that you would unite us around that mission. And God, may you today call your children home, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As we come to a close, we believe that the Lord speaks through his word, and now we consider what would the Lord have you to do with that what steps do you need to take just like the younger brother had to repent and go back home perhaps there's some here this morning that need to repent and go back home come come to the Lord or perhaps you or had a place in your life where you have someone in in your sphere of influence, someone that you love and care about, and you want to you want to pray for them. They're far from God, and your heart is broken for them. There's a prodigal in your life, and you you'd like to lift them to Jesus, that Jesus might intervene. Or perhaps God is calling you to be a part of what we're doing here at our church, calling people to come home, and you want to be a part of that as a member. Whatever decision you need to make, I encourage you to step out and to come as we sing, as we close. Let's all stand and respond to the Holy Spirit.
heart has been in your sight long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from You may be seated. If you're a first-time visitor, if this is your first time here or your first time in a while, we'd love to connect with you. If you're interested in getting to know more about our church so we can better serve you, there's two ways to do that, QR code on the screen and a blue card right in the pew in front of you. You go ahead and fill that out and drop it off in one of the offering boxes on your right as you head out. This Saturday, gentlemen, boys of all ages, we have our men's prayer breakfast. Would love for you to come check it out. If you haven't been yet, I tell you what, you won't leave hungry. Uh, Jeff takes real good care of us. He cooks it up real good. And we'd love to have a time of uh, meet and greet, casual, uh, sharing stories and prayer and a challenge from God's Word. So we'd love for you to be there this Saturday. And August is jam-packed full of stuff. I won't read it all, but we got Thunder Valley Sunday, August 7th. We got Praise and Pie, the 14th, Churchwide Afternoon of Worship, and more at Jimmy Anita's house, the 21st, and finishing off with our picnic, August 28th. And so that's all in uh, your Friday update, and we'd love to be able to connect with you on all those different opportunities. Well, thankfully, we serve a God who calls us undeserved sinners, His children, and He loves us. So let's go to Him and pray. Father, we are not worthy to be called your children. You love us with an everlasting love, and you call us to love others with that same love. So I pray as we've come together, heard from your word, may we emulate the heart of our Father with the people in this room, in our community, and around the world. Thank you for your blessings. We love you. We praise you. Jesus, in your name, amen. You are dismissed.